Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library in Lexington, Massachusetts. I think a lot of you know that. Um, I'm very excited to be here with Jane Healy who wrote The Secret Stealers was just came out on Thursday and it's a book. So it's a book birthday. So if you have some yes. cake or some champagne or whatever, please feel free to have some while we're talking. <laughs> um, but before we get to Jane, I just wanna tell you a couple of things. Um, I did enable captions for this program. So you can see them scrolling along the bottom of your screen if you do not want them. There's a button that says live transcript and next to that is an arrow and you can either hide them or show them. So you can use it as at will as you need. Um, I'd like to thank the Cary Library Foundation which funds all of our adult programming and uh, we couldn't do these kind of programs without them. So we are very thankful to them. You can buy signed books from Haley Booksellers for this program. Um, I will put the link in the chat um, for you. You can buy it tonight or tomorrow or whenever you feel like it, because I'm sure you'll be very inspired. And signed books are gold. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so um, I think that's all of my housekeeping. I will go ahead and introduce Jane. I'm so excited. <laughs> so I just learned today that um, The Secret Stealers is actually um, an Amazon bestseller in war fiction. Yes. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so Jane is the Amazon Charts and Washington Post bestselling author of The Beantown Girls, which many people here have read, and The Saturday Evening Girls Club. When her daughters were young, Jane left a career in high tech to fulfill her dream of writing historical fiction about little known women in history. It was a passion that turned into something much more. Jane shares a home near Boston with her husband, two daughters, and two Cat, two cats. <laughs> I think yeah. you might see some of them roaming around behind yeah. her as we go. <laughs> when she's not writing, she enjoys spending time with her family, traveling, running, cooking, and going to the beach. Who doesn't, Jane? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there was one, um, one review for your book on Amazon that I really like. It's from the Mystery and Suspense magazine. It says, oh, okay. as realistic and heart-wrenching as The Secret Stealers is, it highlights the bravery and strength of the participants of both genders and reignites a faith in humanity. And seriously, after this year, we all need that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was a lovely review. They were so supportive and nice. That was great. Oh, good. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Jane. Welcome to Cary Library. We're so happy to have you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you for having me. And thank you for that lovely intro. Um, so Tonight, I'm going to do my Secret Stealers kind of sneak peek presentation. So there's no spoilers. Um, so don't worry about it if you haven't read the book yet. And I guess we're Facebook Live too. Um, after the presentation, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take any questions you have. And Nina is going to help field those questions for me in the background. So I am going to share my screen now. Okay, Mina, does that look good? Looks great. Yay, okay. <laughs> so tonight I wanna talk about um, how I first, my inspiration for The Secret Stealers, how I first thought about writing the story and a little bit about the research behind the story and then, um, which included 1940s French, France and the resistance, of course, French resistance and some of the inspiration for my main characters, because they, even though they are fictional, they are very much based in fact. Now I'm gonna close this down. Okay. So I keep kind of a running file folder of different possible book ideas. Um, sometimes people send me articles, sometimes I come across something online and I came across a couple of articles this one was one of the first ones. It was, this is Stephanie Check Rader. She was, um, she worked for the Office of Strategic Services in right toward, toward the end of World War II. She, her parents were Polish immigrants. She lived in New York. She was very, very bright. The off, she was recruited by the Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to the CIA to um, on the surface work for the US Embassy in Poland, but was actually working as a spy for the OSS, as an American spy. And so that was, this was one of the first times I'd read about American female spies. I'd read about women in the SOE, which was the British counterpart, female spies who worked for them, women of the French resistance, of course, that were spies. But this is the first time I, I had heard much about 
um, or I really thought about the American women who, who served overseas as spies during World War II. And then I came across this article. Um, these are two old women. They were el elderly women. This is a rather old article. They've since passed away. Betty McIntosh is here. And this is Doris Burrer. And they lived in the same um, retirement community outside of Washington, DC. And they lived on the same street. And they became very good friends and discovered that they both worked for the OSS undercover during World War II. Um, had never met. They both worked for the CIA after the war. Um, they had never met each other. They had never run into each other, partly because Doris served in Italy. Um, she would analyze aerial photographs and things, and she worked undercover there. Betty served in Asia. She spoke Chinese and Japanese, and um, so she, she was in the Pacific Theater of Operation. So they became very close friends, and uh, th they started talking. But even at this age, they there were some things that they still wouldn't share because they had told, taken that oath of secrecy so many years ago. Um, they were both trained before they went overseas as agents. Um, Betty was trained in Maryland, I believe, and then Doris was trained in um, in a facility that is now the Congressional Golf Club, as a matter of fact. So this is Doris during training. This is Doris now, and our actually when this article was written, and this is Doris during her training for the OSS, which is just I thought this was an extraordinary picture. So between the two articles, that had they really piqued my interest, and I was like, I have, I have to dig a little deeper. I think that there, there's this might be my next book project. So I started doing research because I wanted to find out more about not only these women in the shadows who were in the OSS, in the you know the American spies, but also the women of the SOE and the French Resistance, and um, and see, I want to see if I could come up with a narrative arc and, and, and a full manuscript and a full novel. So I did a lot of research. This is just one bookshelf, but there's <laughs> other books around the house, library books. Um, the, it was interesting, my first two novels, the, there was a very finite amount of research for them. You know, you could kind of max out. Um, this is a, you know, this is a much broader scope of story and a much broader scope of research. And um, I could still be doing the research now if I wasn't on deadline. So um, lots of books, articles, online resources. Um, the OSS actually just declassified the personnel records not too long ago, only in 2008. That was really helpful. Uh, it became clear as I took notes and kind of figured out my outline that Paris was going to be another character in the story. So my husband and I had to suffer through a trip to Paris in October, 2019. This was just a gratuitous picture of, um, you know, us getting over jet lag with cappuccino at Le Dumago. And this is Nigel. So I dra dragged my husband all around to um, several museums and just different places I wanted to see the military museum. There's a very small new French resistance museum that just opened. This is again, this is October, 2019. And I found Nigel, this is Nigel Perrin online. He's a historian, he's a professor. He is working on his PhD in modern history. Um, and it's on the spatial history of Paris under occupation. So basically, Finding Nigel was a dream come true because he, he's the exact type of expert I wanted to talk to and meet when I was over there. And I spent an entire day with him, my husband and I, and we walked all over the city and looked at so many different buildings and different sites um, that were important to the French resistance that were, uh, that were important to World War II and, um, and life, during occupied, life in occupied France, occupied Paris. So the problem, who, who and why were these women working in the shadows? I wanna take a little bit of a step back before I get into more of um, my story and what I learned from Nigel that helped me shape the story. The, this is just a very quick history lesson because I had forgotten it from high school and college. It, during the war, France was split into two zones. The free zone was in the South so-called free zone. And then the occupied zone, this was in June 1940, the occupied zone was in the north, 
and of course include the entire coastal military zone and Paris. Um, but the free zone in the south was, there was a Vichy, there was a government, of, a French government established in Vichy, France right here, but it was really free in name only. Uh, the Vichy government and Marcel Pétain, who was head of it, actually collaborated almost from the very beginning when they, when they made this deal. And then by 1942, Germany had occupied all of France. So this is Hitler and Marcel Bétain, the head of Vichy, the Vichy French government, who was um, you know, an unabashed collaborator with the Germans. So on, in June, 9, June 13, 1940, the Parisians went to bed um, and they were still a free country. In, and then the next morning, they woke up to the sound of a German accented voice saying that there was a curfew imposed on the city. And then that by that night, the Germans had marched into the city and occupied all of Paris. This is a famous picture of Hitler from the Eiffel Tower. So these next pictures show um, the life in occupied Paris. And some historians say that, that, that it, it's a little bit propagandist. It, the Nazis released these pictures to make it look like life was fine for the French people. But as you see, when I go through them, it was fine on the surface, but it was very much not fine just underneath the surface. So they show you know, the Nazis playing music in a park. Um, this picture is chilling. I've been to this area many times before this area of Paris and seeing these flags still is unbelievable. As you'll see, there's a lot of people um, on bikes and horse and wag, horse, horse and buggy because um, gasoline petrol was so limited. Another picture of marching. They put up signs all over the city in German for the Germans to um, navigate. A busy day in one of the streets shopping. So it, it looks like on the surface things are fine, but then you know you see the fact that nobody's driving cars and then you see things like this. And so, the, the here's a man and he's wearing a yellow star because he's Jewish. The Germans imposed at some point, all Jews over the age of six had to wear a yellow star. And then little by little, they chipped away at the rights of the Jewish people. Even the, these are Jews who were born and raised in Paris and born and raised in France, been with, been, you know, for many generations. And they were, they were at first it was, they had to wear a yellow star. Then it was, they couldn't go to the movies or the theater. Then it, they couldn't go to public parks. They couldn't walk across the Champs-Élysées. They couldn't grocery shop until the end of the day when there was no produce or anything, you know, any quality groceries left. Um, and, and here's a man, you know, a Jewish man fleeing um, and looking terrified, trying to get out of the city. By 1941, everyone in Paris knew someone who had been arrested. And then in May of 1941 was the first major roundup of Jewish families to Drancy, which was a housing complex just outside the city of Paris and it, the conditions were terrible. And then the second major roundup happened in July, 1942. This is a, this is a picture of the Velodrome de Hive. It is a sports stadium. Uh, it was used for sporting events and campaign rallies and things like that. And on July 17th, the Germans with the assistance of the French police in the city as, imprisoned over 13,000 Jewish men, women, and children in the stadium. And the bathrooms broke after a day. It was incredibly hot because it was height of summer. There wasn't enough food or water to go around. Um, they wouldn't let doctors in. It was horrific and it was happening in the light of day in the middle of Paris and uh, people were horrified. This is a plaque that's at the site where the Velodrome, where the Veldehiv was. And it's very interesting to me. So it says July 16th and 17th, 1942, 13,152 Jews were arrested in Paris and deported and assassinated at Auschwitz. Um, and they, they say there was four, over 4,000 children, over 2,000 women, and over 1,100 men. And the wording in this part is really interesting because 
um, you know, under, under inhumane conditions by the police of the government of Vichy by order of the Nazi occupants, because this is still a source of shame in France and in Paris that their, their, their own French police assisted in imprisoning French citizens because they were Jewish. And um, it's, it, it's very, it's even now hard for some of the French to talk about it. Some, some, the government has acknowledged it more over the years, but it is a tremendous sense of shame. And by saying it was by the police of the government of Vichy, it's like trying to separate France from what, what took place on those horrible days. And this is what the velodrome to have is now. They they raised the building. They just they knocked it down after the war because of you know the horrible events that took place. And the thing that was interesting, um, you know, I think for a while Parisians were just trying to survive in occupied Paris, um, and it was mostly women because men were either off to the were, to the work camps or in or serving in the military. Um, but this event enraged women in the city. And it was really what, what, and the events leading up to it, many of them said it wasn't even a question that we had to get involved, that we had to act, that we had to resist. And after, after this was happening, this inhumanity helped happening right in front of our eyes and we could not ignore it. So Women in, you know, started to join the French resistance. The French resistance started growing and actually becoming more organized. And the OSS and the SOE wanted to aid the French resistance from inside while they were while the Allies were fighting. So the OSS, to give a little background to that, was a precursor to the CIA, as I said, and to American special forces units such as the Navy SEALs. In 1941, President Roosevelt knew that, you know, after studying what the British were doing with the SOE, he knew he had to coordinate intelligence. Um, and so he tapped a friend, an old friend from law school, Major General William Donovan, to head it up, uh, nicknamed Wild Bill. And in 1942, June 1942, where my story takes place, um, it, they changed the name to the Office of Strategic Services. My story begins in 1942. So this is General William Donovan. He was a um, major character in real life and he is a character in the novel. And he was a World War I hero and larger than life, the most decorated soldier in the country's history after World War I. And he, as I said, he went to Columbia with, with Roosevelt. So Donovan was thrilled to, to get involved in this. He, that's, he was kind of a born leader, had huge charisma, started building the organization very, very quickly from scratch. At its peak, it was 13,000 personnel, 35% of them were, were women. Um, 7,500 men and women served abroad in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And because he had to build it from scratch so quickly, he really relied on his networks from his Ivy League days, from his days as a lawyer, um, from, you know, and he was, he was from the upper class. He was definitely a high society type. And because he recruited all of these Ivy Leaguers and high society types, the organization earned the nicknames Oso Social and Oso Snobby. But he also recruited burglars and con men just out of prison who could pick locks and do things like that because why teach an Ivy League guy that? Um, and one of these men named the Georgia Cracker, that's the only name I found for him, uh, on him, is featured prominently in, in one part of the story. So the women of the OSS, Maggie Griggs was in charge of recruiting women. And it was, she talked about how it being very difficult because the wax and the waves were doing these um, splashy campaigns, promising adventure overseas and flat, you know, beautiful uniforms. And Maggie put in, you know, had to advertise in magazines and newspapers, but not really say what the jobs were. And so that made it hard. And the, these women would come for interviews and they wouldn't even really know what they were interviewing for. Dunneman, of course, because this is the 40s, wanted women who were crossed between a Smith grad, a Powers model, and a Katie Gibbs secretary, Katie Gibbs secretarial school. A small percentage of women served overseas, like I said, 
an even smaller one served behind enemy lines. And the actual number of OSS women who served behind enemy lines is still undisclosed to this day. I think it's around a couple hundred just based on research, probably not much more than that. 38 women did go to parachute training school with the OSS. And so it, it's at least 38, but I, I think it's probably a couple hundred. So the OSS and the SOE aided the French resistance by guns and money, by supplying arms and money via airdrop or whatever the ways they could, by engaging in acts of sabotage, bombing of railway lines, grids, any power grids, anything they could, and um, st stealing valuable intelligence and se secrets from the Germans, often by going undercover. These are the wireless radio sets that um, the OSS, the SOE, and the French resistance used to communicate with the allies back in the UK. And um, I really nerded out on the technology and the and encoding of messages and encryption, um, so much so I had to dial it back a little bit, <laughs> according to my editor, but that, this figures prominently in the book. So the story. Anna Cavanaugh is the main character and protagonist. It's told from her perspective. She is completely fictional, but based on a lot of the different women of the OSS that I read about. She is a young widow who went to Radcliffe. She's teaching French in DC. Um, her background is New England, you know, Ivy League. She went to Radcliffe and I, you know, when I was researching and trying to figure out her background, I saw an article on I, the Boston Herald in like 1942 and it said something to the effect of seven Radcliffe women to marry Harvard men. And I was struck by that because I thought here's these women smart and ambitious enough to go to Radcliffe in the 40s. And this is what they're being recognized for. Sure, surely they must have other they must have had other hopes and dreams beyond just marrying a Harvard guy. Um, so Anna is offered a job at the OSS because of her family connections. And, but she, and she eventually, because she becomes hooked on the job and the work and realizes that women are going overseas, she convinces Donovan to send her to France as an agent. So First, she goes to training with the SOE at Bewley. I know it doesn't look like it's pronounced Bewley. This is in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful estate. Um, my British friend corrected me and said that this is how they pronounce it there. They pronounce it Bewley. Um, it was a finishing school for spies. There was many of them around various parts of the UK. Not many, but some. And, um, and so she's trained in tradecraft before going into the field, including explosives and burglary and wireless radio operation and encryption of messages and um, acts of various acts of sabotage. So she befriends two women in the SOE during training, Tatiana Marchand. She is another composite character based on several SOE agents. She is Parisian and Jewish and loses her father and brothers are arrested and taken to the camps. And, um, but she's one of these women who just took to the role. She was, a, you know, they, her family owned a bakery. She, was a, she called herself a former baguette girl, but she was destined for this new role. Um, and then the other one is Nora Khan and she's based directly on SOE agent Nora Khan. She is descended from Indian royalty, was a children's book writer and uh, described as dreamy and ethereal and not a good fit for this role, but she ends up surprising any, everyone. This is Noor Khan before the war. And this is her in her wet, 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 wet uniform. Excuse me, my allergies have my voice very dry. And this is her undercover in Paris as a nanny, uh, as Madeline. And this is the building, and this is a picture we took. Um, this is the building she was um, work, you know, working undercover as the nanny. This is her actual, actual building in Paris. Another character in the book is Josette Rousseau. And she is based on Jeanne de Clarens Rousseau, who is this woman who looks like she's 14, but had actually graduated college in this picture. And she graduated, Jeanne, Jeanne graduated from the top of her class at the Sorbonne. Her family fled to Denard um, when Paris was occupied. 
and she got a job. She was brilliant. She spoke like five languages. So she was hired as a translator for the German soldiers in Denard, and she was not affiliated with the French resistance or any network, but she was so angry about everything that was happening to her country and to the people in it that she started stealing secrets from the Germans on her own. And they started to suspect her in Denard. And so she shipped off, she's shipped off, her family sends her back to Paris because um, it, you know, it, she, they're afraid she's gonna get arrested and sent to the camps. So this is Genet, and then this is Genet when she was older. Um, she has been called the most remarkable girl of her generation. She, like I said, very brilliant. And she, when she returned to Paris after being in Denard, she got a job working undercover at, at the Hotel Majestic. That was the headquarters of the German, uh, German officers in Paris and started working with them and became involved with the Druid resistance network and stole some of the most important military intelligence secrets of the war. And she's just this young girl, but so brilliant and so, um, you know, want, so wanted to fight for her country. She, she did this. Another character in real life who is also in the novel as a supporting character is this man, Dr. Sumner Jackson. He's originally from Maine. He was, he was a, a brave American doctor. He worked at the American Hospital in Paris. That's my cat, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, and the American Paris Hospital in Paris was kind of protected by the International Red Cross. He was given the option to leave before things got really bad um, and take his wife and son to America. But he was, you know, his wife took it, was French and he said, no, I am, I'm staying. And so he immediately got involved with the resistance and falsified documents for POWs who were at the hospital so that they could escape. And he often faked their deaths, their death certificates. And he, he had a house on Avenue Foch near the hospital, which became a safe house for intelligence and a safe haven for undercover agents. So this is a picture we took when we were in Paris. This is Avenue Foch in the 16th. And it's this beautiful grand boulevard. And these are all homes. That's a, that's a house. This is 84 Avenue Foch. And so naturally the Germans took over many of these homes. Some of them had already been abandoned and were empty. But um, so the headquarters of the SD, the secret police, also known as the Gestapo, um, the Nazi Gestapo was 84 Avenue Foch, which was this building. You can see the 84 is very small. And on the top floor right here was um, a prison for French resistance members and allied agents that helped them. And that's where they were tortured for information. And Dr. Sumner Jackson would ride his bike by that house and he could hear the screams of the men and sometimes women on the top floor who were imprisoned. Um, this is a bridge, the Passy Bridge and Metro Station figure prominently in the, in the story. And this is a pretty famous bridge. It's been in the movies Inception, Last Hang on Paris, National Treasure. It's really amazing. It's a popular destination for wedding photos. And when we were there that day, um, there, were, there were several Asian wedding parties who had flown from from different parts of Asia to have, uh, and they had a whole, they had a photographer, they had makeup artists and they had pictures because there's a beautiful view of the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, and so that was, that was just incredible to see. Oh, this is from the movie Inception, same, same bridge. And then this, um, if you've seen the cover, this staircase plays a big role in the story. This is the staircase, um, the bridge you just saw is at the bottom of the staircase and the metro station is up top here. Um, so this uh, figures prominently in a turning point in the novel. Um, I like to show these because people always ask about cover design and do I have a say and I have a really good, um, my publishing company is great, my editors are great and they always give me input. So these are the first three original covers. So this one I did not like because I didn't want, because it was a spy novel, I did not want you to be able to see Anna's face on the cover. Um, so that one I did not like. This one, um, you know, she looks like she's a little too relaxed and casual drinking tea um, when everything is, you know, there's craziness going on around her. I also feel like there's a lot of Eiffel Tower books out there right now. So I didn't want, um, 
the Eiffel Tower on the cover. And when I saw this one, I knew immediately that this was, this had, uh, had the right feel, the right tone, the colors, the fonts. And um, the only thing I didn't like is this person looked like Night of the Walking Dead zombie. So I said, can we just make it clear that this is a woman? And um, so then they came back with these three covers. And this was the one because, um, you know, I wanted it to have this evocative um, tone of like a spy thriller. And this, this one, I just love. It's my favorite of my three books. It's my favorite cover. I just love it. So this story is really about the women in the shadows who stole secrets to turn the tide of the war. And I think one of the things that is that I love to hear since people have started reading it is I have an author's note in the back which separates factor versus fiction. And people are shocked to realize how much of the book is actually based in true history. So um, thank you for listening. And I, as um, Mina said at the beginning, if you'd like a signed book, Haley Booksellers has books available online. That's their website. I have a newsletter. I have a lot of events coming up, including the one be below. Um, I'm interviewing New York Times bestselling historical fiction author Pam Janoff a week from tonight. You can register on my website. And, um, and I do book clubs. I, I Zoom with book clubs pretty much all over the world right now. So um, if you want my book, if you want to chat with me, um, I'd love to talk to your book club. Um, so thanks. I'm going to stop sharing and take any questions you have. <coughs> oh, so I'm going to just come back and hang out with you. Um, thank you, Jane. That was amazing. I actually... Um, was really interested in the fact that you started off with the history of where you got to your book as opposed to starting at the beginning of your book, which was, you know, kind of different. So, um, yeah, and I was going to say that people should feel free to type their questions into the chat. We have a small group here, so you're welcome to unmute yourself as well if you would like and ask Jane directly your question. But I wanted to mention um, on your face, on your website, you yes. actually have a web, like a short webinar about this book and you also have like the frequently asked questions so I was like what can I ask that's not on there <laughs> like it has the inspiration for the book and um you know with the research and things like so I'm just gonna start off with my favorite question to ask an author when they write especially um a complicated or book is um you know are you a pantser or a plotter do you uh, plot everything <laughs> out and then start writing or do you just like start writing and let let it flow from your brain um, I am um, like hardcore plotter. I, I don't know how people do the like let it flow from your brain thing. That's not how I work at all. Especially, <laughs> I you know, with all the research, I need a way to organize the research. So I use Scrivener now, which I didn't use for my first novel, which is a great word processing tool if you are doing a big writing project. So it helps me keep my research in one place and my outline in one place. And um, and really, by the time I'm done with the outline, it's it's like a super rough draft because I have mm -hmm. so much in there. So yeah, I'm definitely an outliner, beginning to end. Okay, and um, you know, one of the things that you had said was that um, that uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm like looking at three different things. At the I know. Time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I you know, you talked a little bit about where you got the idea from the book, but what about about like, what was the kernel for the story that made you say, this is the next thing I'm going to write? You know, um, those elderly women, that article was a real jumping off point. And then that one of those women, Betty McIntosh, has had written a book. It's a, with a small press, the, the Navy press, called um, Sisterhood of Spies, Women of the OSS, where she wrote about her own experiences, but also interviewed several of the women who had worked there at the same time. Not Doris. She had never met Doris. but she, and so that, when I read that book, I was like, okay, there's a story here. Like I have enough here. I mean, I, I had to do much, much more research, but that was a jumping off point for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. that book. On Facebook, Tara says, I love the book. I appreciate it is the different perspective of World War II from the other books that are out there. Um, did you feel like you were doing something different in this book than, than the books that you had seen or read by other authors? Uh, you know, I, I, I just thought that it was an interesting perspective because um, there hadn't been any from the perspective of an, of an OSS woman at mm -hmm. the time. 
Now there's another one um, by about Virginia Hall um, called um, The Invisible Woman that recently came out. So yeah, I mean, they're get, the OSS women are getting a little more um, recognition now, which is great. But yeah, I, I, I thought like, oh, that's an interesting group of women I hadn't, I didn't know about, I hadn't read in any fiction. So that's kind of what prompted that. Mm-hmm. And um, I was reading on, actually I read on Amazon that um, there was a review there and they talked about the other book and they said that yours was um, a bit, not lighter, but a, a bit of an easier read. So I thought that was an interesting comment about, um, you know, this particular topic, but um, how does it feel? How does it, how does it work for you to incorporate real characters and real events into a historical fiction book? How do you keep it from becoming too factual or too made up? You know, that is another question I get a lot and it's a great one. And it's really just trying to figure out the right balance. And that's, um, I'm not saying it's not instinctive, it's really hard, but um, but yeah, I, I try to think about it. Like I, I, of course, the big picture historical dates and times and timeline, that all has to be accurate. You wanna get, if, if there's real people in the book, you wanna get um, those people as right as you can, you know, in terms of their life, history, personality, all of those things. Um, but then you have to take leaves because it's fiction and that's why I write fiction and not nonfiction. And one of the questions, you know, oh, there's two things I always say. One, I, I, someone was talking about it at a historical novel conference and said, you know, your author's note is your best friend, is your best friend because you write that author's note and he, you can tell people what, here's what's fact, here's what's fiction, here are the leaps I have to t- take, you know, here's are the leaps I had to take in writing the story. And the other thing is I always ask myself as I'm writing, if I'm writing an event and it did not happen, could it have happened within the context of the time and the place? And does it feel authentic and organic to that mm-hmm. time and place and to the story? So. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I see that Effie has unmuted herself. So I'm gonna ask her to go ahead and ask her a question. Yeah, it's easier than trying to type it in. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious um, in your book and all the research books I saw behind you re- and when you first opened, there's so many of the books that are coming about about women in spies and behind the scenes is taking place in France. Yes. And your research that you've done, is there a reason why it's been so many have focused to France and why we're not seeing um, the evidence of women uh, or American women in other countries? Uh, I, I think there was a lot of action in France and, yeah. um, and there's a lot of, of research and books about that, nonfiction books about that. And I, that might be part of it. There's a lot available, whereas some of the other, other countries, I don't think that the resources are as readily available. Um, and, and yeah, a lot happened in France. So I think that's part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask a qu- question. Thank you, Effie. I wanted to ask a question about um, your history because you were actually in, in high tech and then left to write. So what drew you to this particular genre of historical fiction? Yeah, um, well, you know, it's one of those things I'd always wanted to write novels and thought it was, I always kind of thought, well, someday, someday, you know, and I had student loans, I got my master's degree at Northeastern, and then I found myself in high tech, basically, because I wanted to pay off my student loans and move out of my parents' house. (laughs) Um, But again, in the back of my mind, you know, I wanted to write novels. Um, When I had my daughters, they're 17 and 14, I took a step back from high tech. Uh, my husband's still in the field and started freelance writing, you know, taking jobs, working from home whenever I could. And that was kind of a turning point because, you know, I, I had my kids, I had turned 30 and I was like, you know, now or never, Jane, like, when are you going to take this fiction writing seriously? And that's when I really kind of started to take some workshops and formed a writer's group with some friends and took that seriously and I'd always loved histor- loved historical fiction and I like the idea of history as a jumping off point for a story so that's that's kind of how I ended up here yeah mm-hmm. but you don't have a like a background in in you know your degree wasn't in history or you know any you know anything like that 
No, no, my parents are, um, my mom was, is a retired English teacher. My dad's a retired history teacher. So I like, ah. it, but like <laughs> kind of in the fam. <laughs> it was in the household. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and I think I told you that our, our book club read Beantown Girls in January for yes, the book club selection. Thank you. Thank you for reading. Yeah. Awesome. And um, a lot of our book club members are actually here. And Tara, again, on Facebook at, says, I also enjoyed Beantown Girls. Are you working on or thinking of writing another book in this time period or maybe in the Pacific theater? Um, you know, not the Pacific theater time period. I'm, I'm, I have a few different ideas I've been jumping back and forth on. I really have to kind of nail one down soon, um, but I am superstitious. So I can't, I won't say more than that. Um, you know, I will say my friend, Elise Hooper, who wrote Fast Girls, which is a great book club book. Um, she is writing one about um, a group of nurses in the Philippines that's coming out in the fall um, from World War II. And that one looks, I think it's going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, did you finish writing this book um, during COVID or was it done and just got at the publishers getting ready to be, um, you know, edited and all of that at, at that, at, you know, at that point, because it came out just last week. So it must yes. have been, it must have been write, my, writing. Yeah. So what, what happened, and I'm so grateful for the timing because the hardest part for me is getting that first, I won't call it a first draft because I, I do a lot of self-editing before I hand it into my editor, but my first draft to my editor was due March 1st of last year. <laughs> and, and so honestly, I don't know, that is the hardest part. I'm not, it would have been really hard to, to do this during COVID. I can do edits and revisions. I love that aspect. And that's what I've been doing for the past, you know, year since getting it ready. Um, you know, a couple first round edits with my editor and my developmental editor and then copy editors and fact checkers, you know, so um, that's, those are the parts I've been working on during COVID, which are easier for me than, than that initial draft for sure. And did you go to Paris, um, obviously before COVID hit, um, to do your research because it looked like, or some of your research, because it looked like you had images of some of, a lot of the space, places that you wrote about. Yes. Yeah. That was, that trip was part um, birthday, but mostly research trip. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was five days. I had a big schedule of stuff to cover while we were there. So um, yeah, and my husband also um, is fluent in French and lived in Paris for some time. So that was helpful as well. So that was actually my next question is, do you speak other languages, uh, French or and or German or and or any other languages? No, I wish I did. He speaks it so beautifully that people think he's from Paris when that we're there, which is really annoying. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But I, I, I'm not good with languages. So I did actually have um, um, two native French speakers review the manuscript to make mm -hmm. sure that not only the French words that are in it are, were accurate, but also kind of the, the English language that is supposed to be spoken in French is accurate as well. And Sandra looks like she's trying to, Sandra, you're on mute, but did you want to ask a question? Um, did Sandra have a question? I'm not sure. Sandra, do you? Do you, no, I don't think so. She's okay. having her tea. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and she might've been talking to somebody else. Um, so do people in the audience or the attendees have, have um, additional questions? Cause I could go on Jane. I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to make sure that people have, feel like they have the opportunity as well. Um, Tara again on um, Facebook says, do you have any recommendations for some nonfiction books that you enjoyed during your research? Or are you are you reading anything interesting now? Um, so a couple, I'm you know I a couple of them are on my shelf. I'm looking at right now. That's Sisterhood of Spies by Elizabeth McIntosh, um, mm -hmm. which is a little difficult to find. Another one I'll grab is um, actually two of them. And I'm superstitious, so I still have my sticky notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> This one is um, brilliant, Madame mm. Prasad's Secret War. And that was incredibly helpful about the, Madame Prasad was a, a, a female leader of the French resistance. And she, she was a, just an amazing woman. And Lynn Olson, Olson is a beautiful writer and researcher. So this is a great one. This one is more about Dr. Sumner Jackson. This is, and it's a shorter book, Avenue of Spies by Alex Kershaw, another terrific writer. Um, highly recommend this one if you're interested. And then I'm interviewing her next week and I'm almost done with this one. 
it comes out next month. It's Pam Janoff's The Woman with the Blue Star. Mm -hmm. She's a brilliant writer. This is a, based on the true stories of some fa Jewish families who had to hide and live in the sewers in Poland during the war and their experiences. And um, it's about a, a, a girl who, who lived in the sewers and a, another girl who was living up above who helped her. So um, it's just, it's a terrific story and another good book club pick too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I saw that on your um, website as well. Um, Essie, did you have another question? Yeah, I, yes, because um, when you brought up Madame Forget's book, I was thinking about that when you were talking and how intricate that story was. In your book that you've written, um, do you have your people crisscrossing into some of these um, historically um, nonfiction groups like Madame Forget's um, uh, spy spy circle her network uh, yeah somewhat the druid network was kind of a, a smaller the one that's featured in the story in the secret stealers it was a real network uh, yeah, the druids yeah, network yeah. but um but madame Brassard's was kind of one of the larger bigger networks right. in paris and the druids was like a small offshoot of that really okay. uh, but yeah so there's definitely like the history and some of the stories the true stories of these incredibly brave people in Paris at the time, I definitely re wove into the story. So, so can you explain a little bit more about how you do that? Because when you, having read that book and a couple of the others that you looked at, I'm thinking how as so somebody trying to write that, do you figure out how much of that do I try to weave in and how much of it do I just sort of take a little piece of it and try to capture it? It's so hard at the, I can't even, I don't even know. <laughs> it was really, really hard. This is the hardest book I've ever written <laughs> by far. I think part of it is because it was, a uh, um, cause I, I knew I wanted to write a spy thriller. So that like, that's a different type of book than my first two books. And yeah. I wanted it to be suspenseful. And so the timeline has to be really tight and accurate. And the, the t plot twist, have to really work because if you mess up one thread then everything yeah. falls apart down the, down the road so it was hard all I know is like there were certain like little vignettes that I I, I tagged in my notes here and um and also in in Madame Prasad's book um that I was like oh that's just amazing like at the hospital the American hospital in Paris they have a Christmas Eve dinner and they were hiding pigs like in the back of the hospital so that they could feed the soldiers a decent Christmas dinner. And they were boiling vegetables in these big, like in huge vats out in, in the courtyard to feed this, these, you know, these POWs so they would have a decent meal for Christmas. And so things like that, you're like, you know, about humanity and about how people got through together. Like those are the type of stories that I love that I think really kind of bring it to life more for people, the smaller stories within the big story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so do you, is it, actually I was gonna say, Michelle says that she would love to have you back um, after she's read this book for maybe one of her book clubs. She works um, with our seniors at our senior center. Oh, definitely. Um, <laughs> so I will share your uh, contact information with her. Um, so is nonfiction your preferred um, genre to read or do you use it to just for research and then you, what do you prefer to read? I, I'm kind of all over the map. Um, yeah, I'm all over the map. I, but I will say when I'm, you know, I'm doing these historical in, uh, author interviews, so I'm reading historical fiction for that, obviously. Mm -hmm. But when I'm writing historical fiction, I tend to stay away from the genre because I'm just, I don't want anything to kind of color what I'm working on, um, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. uh, I love mysteries and thrillers. My 14 year old is a huge reader. So I, try to read what she's reading sometimes. So she loves like sci-fi fantasy. Um, we recently both read The Invisible Life of Adler Rue by V.E. Schwab that just came out. And, um, we listen to audiobooks in the car all the time. We're listening to some memoirs right now. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of all over the map. Mm -hmm. And I read on your website that you have, you do try to mentor people ask you like how do you become a better writer and one of your pieces of advice was really to have an author's group or to have you know people to throw ideas off of do you have a group that you work with and that you have like beta readers and things like that you know um I did and I still am friends with all of them and you know there's a small group four of us from Boston, my Boston Magazine days I was a freelancer for Boston Magazine 
years ago now. And um, I met my friend Susanna for coffee today, as a matter of fact, uh, mm -hmm. up in Salem. Um, but I, I'm at the point now where um, I have a great relationship with my editor. Um, I, I've become a pretty decent self editor. So I don't, I don't have beta readers anymore just because I, I run out of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there's just no time. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have beta readers anymore, but, um, but I do, I think you really have to find your people because publishing and writing is, well, writing is very solitary and publishing is very hard. So you just have to find your support group, wherever, wherever that is. That's so true. Um, I was also wondering, uh, one of the things obviously that was in your biography is that you decided to write about sort of women's stories um, historically. Have you found that it's easier to find information now about those sort of hidden stories as people are becoming more aware of, um, you know, the history of black people in the world and history of Asian people in the world and now women as well? Um, I think so, absolutely. And I, you know, the, a great resource, not so much for this book, but for the Beantown Girls and the Saturday Evening Girls Club um, was the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, mm -hmm. um, which is dedicated to American women's history. And they, they're a research library and they had, um, you know, I, somehow along the way, one of the Red Cross Clubmobile Girls, which is what the Beantown Girls is about, uh, of World War II had a relationship with Harvard because they had 13 boxes of letters and diaries and notes and all sorts of stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, but I think, yeah, I think now these stories are really being celebrated. And, um, and yeah, I think that there's, you know, there's more awareness and there's more, um, I don't know, there's more of an interest too, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it gives, for me, it feels like it gives a fuller picture of what was actually happening in those times. Yes, because, yeah. Because, you know, it was, it wasn't just a certain group that made changes and, and, and fought and resisted and did, you know, have that sense of humanity, I guess. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would like to ask you if you have any, um, any particular book recommendations for us um, to read. Like you had mentioned the Pam Jenoff Jan book, which I know that um, we'll all be looking forward to. But um, given COVID, maybe you've had more time to read lately. <laughs> what do you think we should read? <laughs> are you thinking historical fiction or just in general? Or what do you think? Just in general, because you said that you like all genres. Yeah, um, no, that, you know, I mean, if for something completely different, that Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, I thought was a beautifully written book and sort of jumped genres. It was like, it was very ambitious. And I think she pulled it off. It was really interesting. Um, interesting story. That's a that's a good one. Um, Pam's book, obviously. I was just talking to my friend um, Linda Loigman, and she, and I she was on my launch panel last week. And her book, The Wartime Sisters, actually takes place in Springfield, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, at the Springfield Armory. And that gives a perspective of what it was like on the home front during the war. And so that's always. I think a really di another different take, you know, not just you know, people who are at the front, uh, at the front lines. And uh, oh, someone, Michelle Kelleher said, Wartime Sisters was fantastic. It is fantastic. So, <laughs> and she does book clubs too. She's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that brings up a qu another question from my perspective is um, you, the Beantown Girls was sort you know, sort of in your backyard. Um, was it a huge stretch to do something that was across the ocean? Um, no, you know, I, no, I, I think the, with the Beantown girls, those diaries and letters, that research um, was so thorough. They, these girls knew they were witnessing history and their accounts uh, at the time, I mean, they, they took down these journals were beautifully written and they really gave me my story. I mean, so much of that book is based on fact. And the reason it wasn't that hard to write about Europe is because they're, their perspective and their experiences were so well preserved. That was incredibly helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because we had a program last night about William Shakespeare and they said like 400 years ago, people didn't keep kind of documents. Uh, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. That would be harder. <laughs> yeah. It would be harder. Um, and do you prefer to do your research in at home, like uh, online at home, or do you prefer to go out to the place and learn about it? It kind of depends. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place, you know, and I do 
a bulk of it up front to feel like I have kind of a baseline of knowledge, but then um, it's all, it's a kind of a constant process with the little details, like things like clothing and food and dinner, you know, restaurant menus and, you know, all, all those little fact, like details that matter too, you know, they're important to the story. So I'm kind of, you know, I'll go down rat hole, rabbit holes of like fashion, you know, Christian Dior fashion. And, <laughs> and I'm on <laughs> Pinterest for three hours looking at dresses and I'm like, what am I doing? So, yeah. <laughs> It is true that as a reader, when something doesn't gel, especially historical fiction, when, you know, somebody's wearing an empire dress, you know, in, you know, in the 1700s, you know that that's not true. Yes. So um, it does pull you out of the story quite a bit. Yes, there was one very, very minor detail that we all missed um, that's getting fixed on the Secret Stealers. I'll leave it at that. I'm sure someone in this group, book group will well, guess what it is? It's on page 119. So. <laughs> I'm going to look that up. And we're fixing it. <laughs> so. Well, it's good to, good to know. It's funny how you, you know, you go through editors and, uh, you know, arcs and all of that, and then you still miss that uh, one little piece. It kills me because I, I am so obsessive about that stuff. And so it just kills me when it happens, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It's a little bit of humor. That you, you, if you ever saw Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind had an electric light. Oh, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Can only do our best. Or even like, uh, you know, I always talk about Bridgerton, you know, people watching oh. the show, you know, were like, oh, they didn't have those back in the 1800s, you know, the um, lines on the streets and things like that. So, so you, you know, you just can do the best you can. That's right. That's right. You but I do have to say that us eagle eye readers will always call, <laughs> will always figure it out. Oh, yeah, totally. And that's why it kills me, because I know I'll hear about it. <laughs> <You> <laughs> I, I have one more question, if I can throw it out. You, you've written, you know, Mina brought it up that you've written a lot, Bean Town and the others, focusing on women. Have you found that they have fissile, philosophically changed how you see yourself in the future or for your children or how you try to... Um, your values or um, interpretation of life and how to go forward? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've thought about it in that way, but it was really interesting going through this time period that we're in right now, which is clearly historical, right? There is gonna be a lot of writing about the pandemic. I'm really interested to see what the teenagers that are teenagers right now are gonna write about in 10 years. I talked to my daughters about that a lot. And I got an email the other night from a nurse who has been giving vaccines all over the state, but a lot at the Heinz Convention Center. And she's also been doing other volunteer work um, on the front lines of COVID. And she said that, um, you know, she loved, loves my books. And she, because of, re after reading the Beantown Girls, she started taking, keeping a scrapbook and a journal because she knows that her family will really appreciate seeing what she went through during these historic times. And that, that was really moving to me. I thought that was, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. It sounds too like, um, not only did you hear and read about uh, uh, stories that inspired you, but some really hor horrific and horrible stories too that oh, yeah. Yeah. hadn't um, come to light yet. No, no. And Par I, I, Paris was a, a dark place. You know, Paris is a beautiful city is one of my favorite cities, but it was a dark time. It was a dark place during those years. It was not, it was not an easy place to be. Mm -hmm. So maybe my last question was, how do you pull yourself out of, you know, that kind of research, you know, when you go to that dark place to write a story that can feel a little bit lighter um, and hopeful? Yeah. You know, I, I think that I always say like, you can't sugarcoat war. You definitely can't sugarcoat war. And you have to, um, to show those grittier details. But I like to, you know, both of my war stories end on an up note because these people were, um, I mean, the, the human spirit of these people was extraordinary. And that was the part, that's the takeaway, you know, that they, they and I guess maybe that's one reason why people like reading these historical fiction now because we're in kind of a dark time and, and but people in the World War II were too and they came out of it and were okay on the other side and so I just um, that's kind of my perspective on it I don't want to sugarcoat 
all of the horrific things that happened during the war. And I certainly, that's why not everyone survives in my books. Not everyone like gets a happy ending, but I do like to leave it on an up note at the end. Well, we certainly appreciate that because I think we all need a little bit of, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, inspiration. Exactly. And hope. exactly. No, this has been wonderful. I feel like Thank I've you. learned so much and, um, you know, I can't, I can't tell people enough how awesome these books, your books are. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mina. Thank you so much for having me. I know we talked about this for a long time. It's nice to finally be able to do it. This is so good. <laughs> That's right. And, back, and when we're back in like real, you know, real life, I hope that we can have you back um, to talk about your next book, which you have, haven't been able to tell us about. <laughs> <laughs> I can't no wait. question though. <laughs> that would be great. That'd be so great. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here, here and on Facebook. Yeah, and remember- I you can buy signed books from Jane at Haley Bookstores, which I did put in the um, chat Thank and you. I will send out in the recap as well. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, Dick yeah. Haley is a rock star. So um, yeah, I'd like to support the local indies. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well, have a wonderful night, Jane, and to everybody that's been here with us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>